Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, to today's webinar in the SORTUP and ESTCP webinar series. Uh, my name is Rula Deeb. I'm a principal at Geosyntac Consultants in Oakland, California, and the organizer of the webinar series on behalf of SORTUP and ESTCP. I will be facilitating today's call. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of SORTUP and ESTCP by Dr. Robin Nissan followed by a sneak peek at a few of the upcoming webinars in the series. Following Robin's opening remarks, uh, we will transition to the technical portion of the webinar. We will have three speakers on today's webinar. The first speaker will be Dr. Andrew Gessner from the Air Force Research Laboratory. He will give a short 10-minute presentation, followed by two longer presentations by Dr. Benjamin Harvey from the Naval Air Force uh, Warfare Center, and Dr. John Lascala from the U.S. Uh, Army Research Laboratory. Uh, both Ben and John's presentations will be followed by a short Q&A session, and we will conclude the webinar with an interactive Q&A session for all our three speakers. Today's uh, webcast will be broadcasted in listen mode only. You may submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to submit questions in advance of the Q&A session. With over 160 attendees on today's call, it is logistically challenging to open all the lines for oral questions. Therefore, your phone lines will remain listen-only throughout the presentation. With that, I would like to turn this over to Dr. Robin Nissan, who, has, uh, who is the SIRTUP and ESTCP Program Manager for Weapons Systems and Platforms. Before joining SIRTUP and ESTCP, Robin was with Navair's Weapons Division, China Lake in California since 1984. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Robin. Well, thank you very much, Rue. I do appreciate it. And what I'm going to do is just tell you a little bit about uh, CERTIP and ESTCP. Uh, the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program was established by Congress in 1991, and it is a partnership with uh, Department of Defense, DOE, and EPA. We are re a requirements-driven program. We identify high-priority environmental S&T investment opportunities that address DOD requirements. Uh, we fund advanced technology development, and we also fund fundamental research. In environmental security technology certification program, uh, we do demonstrations that uh, demonstrate innovative, cost-effective environmental and energy technologies. We like to capitalize on past investments and transition technologies out of the laboratory. Uh, we promote implementation, and we look to facilitate regulatory acceptance. We have five program areas, and those five program areas are listed, are listed here. Energy and water, environmental restoration, munitions response, resource conservation and climate change, and weapon systems and platforms. In the weapon systems and platforms program area, uh, we have uh, several areas that are our major focuses, and those are listed here. Uh, surface engineering and structural materials, energetic materials and munitions, uh, noise and emissions, and waste reduction. Uh, today, we're going to spend a little bit of time in the uh, structural materials area, and we do have three speakers, and I just wanted to take a moment to, to give you my feelings of why we're doing it the way we're doing it. Uh, we are focusing on a seed project first that uh, Dr. Gentner will present, uh, and then we'll have uh, someone talking about some of the work that they've done um, in a sort of full proposal. That would be uh, uh, Dr. Ben Harvey. And then finally, uh, we progress to someone who's worked both in the CERTIP area and in the ESTCP area. That would be Dr. John Lascala. So we're going to give you a little bit of a flavor for uh, very much researchy work, uh, and then uh, fundamental aspects, and then uh, transition, things that we think are, are close to and are uh, worthy of demonstration. So that's what you're going to hear about today. What I'm also going to do now is tell you a bit of what you might hear in the next few weeks. 
So here is a list of the next several uh, CERTIP and ESTC webinars, and you'll see some very interesting things, acoustic methods for underwater munitions, solar technologies, lead-free electronic, uh, electronics, excuse me, bioremediation approaches at chlorinated solvent sites, and environmental DNA, a new tool for species inventory, inventory monitoring and management. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Rula. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Robin. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Andrew Gettner, who is a senior chemical engineer with the Air Force Research Laboratories Rocket Propulsion Division at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Andrew's current research includes investigations of the connections between the chemistry and the performance characteristics of materials and interfaces for solid rocket motors, including advanced propellant binders. Andrew has co-authored over 110 publications and has been awarded seven U.S. patents in the fields of polymer science and surface science. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Andrew. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, Rula, for that uh, nice invitation, and, and thank you, Robin, for the great overview of the uh, CERTIPIN ESTCP program. I'm going to talk to you about the C project that we have in uh, ISO sign 83 solid rocket motor propellants uh, today. And it is going to be a very brief talk, so we're just going to touch basically on some of the background and payoffs for DOD, uh, but we are going to give a more detailed talk in a couple of months at the uh, ACS meeting in Denver. So if anyone would like to have a, a more lengthy presentation, you can certainly feel free to contact me or uh, come and see the presentation. The reason that we're doing this project is because <coughs> ISO sign as a class of chemicals are extraordinarily useful, but they also have some insidious side effects. And the most uh, sort of insidious of those effects is what we call chemical sensitization. So if you are working with isocyanates and you happen to get a little bit on your hand and wipe it off, you won't feel any pain or notice that anything is wrong. However, over the course of time, what will happen is that your body will begin to build up an allergic reaction, not only to isocyanates, but to all sorts of chemicals in general. And so by the time that you figure out that you're developing this allergic reaction, your body can develop all sorts of problems, even things like breathing problems that are completely seemingly unrelated to the exposure on your skin. So by the time you figure out what has happened to you, you're stuck with an allergic reaction that, like most allergies, will make you very miserable. It's often a, a involves significant alterations to people's lifestyle. It ends their careers, um, and it's something that you're stuck with. It, it basically persists for many, many years. So because it's so insidious, organizations like OSHA would like to significantly limit and control the exposure to isocyanates in the workplace. And, of course, our seed project is basically designed um, to look at an area where isocyanates are in use and try and replace them. So the area that we picked is solid rocket motor propellants. Uh, in solid rocket motor propellants, the propellant basically needs to be a solid with a very specific shape. However, the energetic materials that provide the propulsion are sort of powdery, loose grains of material. So there needs to be a way to glue those loose grains together. The way that that's done is that you introduce a liquid resin that basically sort of penetrates all the nooks and crannies between the particles, and then the isocyanates within that resin will basically solidify it so that all the particles are held together. And what we would like to do is to provide for uh, an alternative chemistry that does the same function um, of gluing the particles together and can be worked with as easily as the current generation of propellant binders are now, but that will avoid uh, the significant occupational health issues associated with isocyanates. So this is really a sort of seed effort, and the goal of the seed effort isn't to completely develop uh, a solution from start to finish, but basically to try and do what we call mitigate risk. So that means we try and answer some basic questions, uh, explore alternatives, understand whether or not they're likely to be successful, um, try and find out whether or not we're going to have any uh, unplanned surprises. And based on that information, then we can go forward with confidence if we find an alternative that looks promising in a full program. So th this is not a full program effort. This is a limited effort that's designed to basically answer a few questions. So really what we focus on is just getting a sense of does the chemistry work, so will we be able to use it in the way that we use the current chemistry now uh, without having to change a lot of processes? And second, are the properties of the materials created by this alternate chemistry the same as the current generation of propellants? So we want to know 
whether or not we have to sacrifice any kind of performance in order to achieve the environmental benefits. And of course, what we'd like is for there to be no degradation in performance. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of things that have and have not worked in this program. So uh, the results that you're seeing from DNA nucleobase binders on the screen, this is an example of something that was a great idea and we were able to make a new kind of binding system for propellants out of it. But basically what we found is that there is an unexpected surprise in this material system. Because we are using uh, a binding technology that involves polar molecules in a very nonpolar medium, which is unusual for these kind of systems. Normally they exist in a very polar medium. We find that there is basically self-association between the binders that we didn't expect. Uh, these things have to be low viscosity liquids so that we can mix them in with the uh, energetic materials and the propellant. And the bottom line is that although one of these two materials is a low viscosity liquid, the other one is not. So you really are unable to mix these together the way that you would like. Uh, what that means is that while it's an interesting system, and deserves some further study, it's not really ready uh, to be considered as a candidate uh, replacement for isocyanates yet. Uh, an example of something that has worked for us is thiolene chemistry. This is a, an alternative to isocyanate chemistry, and basically we've done some testing to show that this chemical reaction will occur under the times and temperatures necessary to do the mixing of propellants. It makes the kind of networks that we expect it to make, and those networks have the physical properties that we expect out of the network. So. We're able to do some testing to confirm that the chemistry basically works, and now we're working on answering the second of those questions, which is uh, what are the properties of the actual propellant system. Now, this heat project is one of several that's being funded by CERDIP in this area, and all of them, uh, regardless of which sort of efforts we find to be successful or not, uh, anything that is successful is going to have very significant benefits for DoD operations, and this is really what I want to focus on for a minute. Uh, elimination of isocyanates not only gets rid of the significant occupational health risk that's associated with these materials, but also it helps to solve some other issues in manufacturing of propellants. So isocyanates tend to be moisture sensitive, which means that if you manufacture on a day with high humidity and on a day with low humidity, you're prone to get different kinds of results. Uh, replacing the isocyanate chemistry can potentially eliminate that kind of variability issue. Uh, also by looking for chemistries that are ubiquitous in nature, uh, we're not just gonna sort of kick the can down the road another 20 years and end up with an alternative chemistry that ends up being also regulated and has to be replaced once again. We're trying to basically replace these for a very long-term use and service. Uh, a lot of rocket motors last for many, many decades, and we need to be able to manufacture these over the course of many decades. So we wanna be sure that we don't face future regulation that inhibits our ability to manufacture these motors. Uh, like we're facing now. And then the last sort of benefit for DOD is that isocyanates are used all throughout DOD in many different kinds of applications, paints, coatings, sealants, foams. So in some of those applications, we should be able to transfer some of the technology that we're developing for rocket propellant binders to those other applications as well. So we can improve uh, occupational health and safety, not just for folks that are making solid rocket motors, but also in a wide variety of industries all throughout DOD. Um, so just kind of as a final note, uh, what we do in the SEED program, like you said, is we will continue to look at ways to mitigate risk. So we'll continue to make propellants and ensure that the propellants perform the way that we expect them to without any uh, unusual surprises. If that looks promising, then we will go forward and propose to do a, a full SEED effort like you're going to hear about from Ben and John. But even the things that don't work so well, uh, such as the nucleobase binding technology, We'll take that technology and we'll go to an agency such as the Air Force Office of Scientific Research and say, hey, we have a very interesting technology, but it's not really mature enough for use in applications yet. Can we do some fundamental research to try and understand this technology a little bit better so we can make use of it? And that way, the cert -MC program basically will eventually generate uh, a nice return on investment, even if the ideas that we're looking at today aren't necessarily the ideas that we go forward with in the cert program itself. Uh, so. Lastly, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the folks that have worked very hard in this program at the Air Force Research Lab, uh, Josiah Reams, Jacob Marshashak, Mike Ford, Tim Haddad, and Joe Mabry. Uh, they've been a great team to work with, and uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, have their talents uh, employed in service of this project. So uh, with that said, I will just uh, remind you that if you want more information, feel free to go and visit the CERTIF website or send me an email or call and leave me a message. And, uh, I will be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you, Andy, for a very interesting presentation. We have a couple of questions for you. 
before we move on to our next speaker. Um, the first one is, how will you know that you have achieved a significant improvement in occupational safety and health? That's an excellent question. <clears throat> and in this case, there are really sort of two answers. There's a logical answer and there's an empirical answer. The logical answer will come sooner. Because the isocyanates are one of the most insidious chemistries around, uh, because their function is directly related to the chemical structure, we know that if we eliminate the structure and as long as we are not replacing it with something that we know to be uh, equally insidious or in the same sort of category, that we will achieve a significant improvement. The empirical answer to that, of course, is that as we continue to develop the system, if it merits further development, then we will do the requisite safety and health studies and we will collect that data and we would expect that data to confirm our sort of initial uh, logical inferences, but eventually we will get uh, the data that backs that up. And at that point, once we have the data in hand that says this is safe, uh, this doesn't cause the same sort of irritation and uh, response by the human body that isocyanates cause, that we will know that we have achieved uh, the improvement. Thank you, Andy. And can you uh, perhaps talk a little bit about why you think this approach has not been tried before? Um, yes, that's another good question. Really what we are doing with these approaches is trying to take a look at new and different chemistries. So solid rocket motors in particular, uh, the current generation technology was developed in the 1960s. Um, and so since the 1960s, there have been a lot of advances in understanding of the fundamental chemistry of these types of materials. Um, and because the environment in which these are used is a very conservative environment and people are much more willing to stick with what they know rather than to change to something that they don't know. Uh, there is sort of an inertia that keeps us from taking the latest, greatest developments and then quickly plugging them into uh, this particular uh, application area. So where this hasn't been done before is that uh, really the chemistries that we're investigating uh, really haven't been available before. If you go back in time to when people are looking at alternatives, these were not really well known and understood, and it's only in the last few years that they've become available. So um, we really are getting a chance through the C program to look at something uh, new that hasn't um, been known about before, but it really hasn't been well understood how it works uh, until just the last few years. Great, thank you. And one last question, and before I ask it, I just want to remind people to ask uh, questions using the chat button. And, uh, or the chat box, and also to remind everyone that you can download a copy of Andy's slides and actually the whole slide deck for today's webinar by going to the sort of an ESCCP webpage and there's a PDF with uh, all the information, including Andy's contact information if you have follow-up questions for him. So the last question for you, Andy, are these compounds commercially available at reasonable prices so as to be competitive with current chemistries? So some of these compounds are available as commercial compounds. Uh, some of them are available at reasonable prices. Others are available as specialty chemicals because the volume that they're used in right now is small, but we would expect the price to drop uh, to something reasonable if they were utilized uh, more extensively by technology development. Um, that's kind of a typical chicken and egg problem that we always have in developing new materials. They're, they always start out very, very expensive, and you have to convince people to use them on the promise that the cost will come down. And fortunately, we have a lot of historical data that can be used to show that indeed, uh, as more of the material is used, the cost will come down. Um, and then some of these materials that we're looking at also are brand new, uh, but as we move forward, one of the considerations that we have to take into account is how will we actually manufacture these systems. So if we are looking at new materials and we can't find uh, commercially available sources that we can scale up to use to replace those, then that becomes an impediment. And those particular technologies will basically receive lower consideration. Great. Thank you, Andy. And uh, we'll get back to you with additional questions during the final Q&A session. And with that, I'd like to introduce our second speaker. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Harvey is a senior research chemist with the Naval Air, Fair, uh, the Naval Air Warfare Center um, in China Lake, California. Ben's current research interests include sustainable high-temperature composites, atom economic catalysis, and high-density renewable fuels. Ben is a recipient of the 2011 
Dr. Dolores M. Etter, uh, Top Scientists and Engineers of the Year Award, in part for the work that he's going to talk to us about. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ben. Well, thanks so much, Rula. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Robin Nissan for putting this together. Um, so Andy talked about an initial seed effort. My program's a little farther along, so we've had about three years of funding. So uh, I'd like to present a lot of the results of that today. Um, but overall, what we're really trying to do is um, make high temperature resins from renewable sources. So if we look really quickly at uh, the agenda, I'd just like to give a brief overview of, of what is a composite and then cyanate ester resins for those of you that, that don't know what, uh, what type of compounds those are. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about synthesis and characterization of both uh, bisphenols and cyanate esters from uh, various biomass sources. We'll then move on to uh, properties of these renewable thermosetting resins. So how do they compare to conventional petroleum-based resins? Um, and then we'll even go into a little bit uh, the fabrication of, uh, or the formulation of bulk molding compounds and even the fabrication of uh, composite parts for future testing. We'll then finish up with some, uh, some conclusions. So most of you probably already know what a composite is, but in general it's just a combination of a structural component, and that could be something uh, like a carbon fiber or a glass fiber fabric. Uh, it can be something else uh, that's used to, for example, uh, reduce the flammability like a, a clay or other inorganic filler. Um, and that's combined with a, a matrix material, and that's a, a polymeric material. And today we're going to be talking about thermoset resins. So uh, in this case, there are small molecules that when we, we heat them up, uh, they convert to a, a network structure that essentially has an infinite molecular weight, and uh, the, the chemistry that we'll be talking about is cyanide esters. So one of the questions that might come up is, uh, why are we so interested in composites? Uh, you know, these are organic molecules, and they weigh significantly less than uh, conventional structural, structural materials like steel and aluminum. Uh, and this obviously can result in reduced fuel usage, improved range for uh, military vehicles. Obviously, they're also not as subject to corrosion as, uh, as metal surfaces. So, for example, you can see two pictures here. Uh, the Boeing 787 is actually 50% by weight composites. And the F-35 uh, Joint Strike Fighter is about 35% composites. So we can see that um, modern military platforms are highly composite dependent. So on the bottom of the screen here, I've got an example of a cyanate ester resin, and the one I have is one that would be produced from bisphenol A. Uh, you've probably heard a lot about bisphenol A in, in the news and in regard to uh, uh, potential concerns about its toxicity. But cyanate esters actually uh, polymerize via a cyclotrimerization reaction. Uh, so the, the, figure, the, uh, <clears throat> the structure on the right gives an example of what that looks like. So they form these cyanurate ring system uh, on each side of the, the original bisphenol. Um, the reason we're interested in cyanate ester resins is they have, for example, higher TGs, and TG means glass transition temperature, uh, and lower water uptake than epoxy resins, so there's sort of a next generation uh, resin. Um, when they cure, there are no volatile byproducts like uh, water or other small molecules, um, and that aids in the, the fabrication of, of composite parts. Uh, typically, these resins are synthesized from bisphenol, like bisphenol A. And with that in mind, uh, we've really been researching uh, renewable sources of phenols that can be derived from biomass sources. Um, there are a number of benefits that, that could be realized. Uh, those include you know, reducing petroleum usage because we're using sustainable phenols. And we'll also find, as, as we go through this, this brief, that uh, several of the renewable phenols actually have uh, structural motifs that allow for improved synthetic efficiency, as well as structures that you wouldn't normally find in petroleum-based phenols, which have led to uh, improved properties in some cases. Uh, so just as an example of, of some of the structures that we find uh, in nature, if we think about waste biomass, and a really crude waste biomass source, for example, uh, forestry residue, uh, you know, it's mainly composed of three uh, biopolymers. 
So one of them is cellulose, and that's really just a glucose polymer. A lot of work has been done on converting cellulose to things like biofuels and fine chemicals. Um, hemicellulose, which you see in the upper right, is also a sugar polymer. It's a little bit easier to work with. It's an amorphous uh, molecule, typically, um, and a lot of work has been done on converting that to biofuels and fine chemicals. But the structure on the bottom, uh, lignin, which typically comprises uh, roughly 25% of the mass of a, a tree, for example, uh, you notice that it has a number of aromatic groups, and these are rigid structures uh, that are very suitable for high temperature polymer applications. So when we think about starting materials, obviously we'd like to go for the cheapest source available. Uh, for example, the, the current market price for lignin is about five cents a pound. Um, so if we can utilize lignin as a, as a resource to produce high temperature polymers, uh, not only uh, can we make these, these uh, high performance materials that have a number of benefits for the, the DOD, uh, but we could also potentially reduce the cost compared to petroleum precursors. So moving directly into uh, the results, uh, I'll show you some of the simplest molecules that you can get from lignin. So on the left-hand side here, I've got a model of what lignin look, looks like, and there are actually well-known processes to convert that to the molecule vanillin. So this is, can be done catalytically uh, via, via an oxidation reaction. Um, and vanillin, this is the same molecule that you're familiar with in, in vanilla extract, uh, exact same molecule. Um, we can also do simple modification. For example, we can hydrotreat that, treat it with hydrogen and a catalyst to uh, make the related molecule creosol. But speaking first about vanillin, um, we imagine the synthetic route, if you look at the right-hand side of the, of the slide, uh, where we could make a simple bisphenol from that, that we could produce both cyanate esters and also thermo thermoplastics uh, like a polycarbonate. Um, and I'll show you on the next slide how we do that. So I apologize for all the, the non-chemists in the room, a, a few structures here. Uh, but on the left-hand side, you see that we actually developed an electrochemical route. Um, so this was very nice. Uh, you can run the reaction in water uh, and directly produce a bisphenol, but it actually has two alcohol groups that we need to get rid of. So, and you can read, read about this more if you'd like uh, in the paper. It's actually listed on the, on the bottom of the slide, uh, just recently published in Green Chemistry. Uh, but we actually found a, a, a reaction to uh, directly convert it to the bisphenol in, in three relatively straightforward steps that don't require any, uh, any heavy metal catalysts. Um, we also found a direct route. So you can see that on the right-hand side. This is a McMurray-type reaction where we directly convert the aldehyde um, and then go through a series of other steps to uh, form the cyanate esters. So in this case, we've uh, synthesized two cyanate esters. Uh, one's called, uh, for the, the purposes of this brief, Vansi, and the other one, H2 Vansi. And the difference between them is uh, one still has a double bond in the middle of the uh, molecule and the other one doesn't. We also took the, uh, the hydrogenated version of the bisphenol and made a polycarbonate from it. You can see that in the center of the screen. So just to go over a few properties of these molecules, uh, the polycarbonate had a glass transition temperature of 86 degrees C. So that compares to a polycarbonate from bisphenol A, if it had roughly the same molecular weight, would have a glass transition temperature of about 120 degrees C. So uh, quite interesting in regards to glass transition temperature. Um, and this is a relatively low molecular weight uh, polycarbonate. In regard to the uh, cyanate esters, um, Interestingly, uh, H2 Vansi, uh, we were unable to uh, effectively cure it, uh, but the hydrogenated version uh, we could cure, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. So on this slide, uh, on the left-hand side, we've got some uh, thermogravimetric data, and essentially what we're doing is starting from the resins themselves, and we just slowly heat them up, uh, and we measure mass loss. Um, so if you look at the blue line, that's uh, the hydrogenated version, H2 Vansi, and you notice the slight weight loss at about 200 degrees C, it turns out that that's actually loss of a small amount of solvent. And then it cures to form the, uh, the thermoset, and you notice that it's stable to well above, up to around 350 degrees Celsius. You notice that uh, H2 Van, or I'm sorry, that Vansi, uh, that, that uh, still has the double bond, Actually, we see a significant degradation at 200 degrees C, and then it slowly degrades 
uh, continuously, uh, even at 200 degrees C. So it appears that it, it's not curing completely. And what happens is the very high melting point of Vansai uh, actually doesn't allow for it to, uh, to fully cure. So it melts at about 237 degrees, whereas the cross-linking reaction can take place as low as about 200 degrees. Uh, so it never has a chance to fully form a network. Uh, H2 Vansai, though, does fully cure and forms a, a complete network. So from the previous screen, we saw what we could do with vanillin. Uh, the highest TG that we were able to get was about 202 degrees C. Uh, and that is comparable to uh, the glass transition temperatures of a number of epoxies, but is quite low for cyanate esters. So we decided to uh, look at creosol, which you may remember from one of the earlier slides. Uh, that we could derive from, from vanillin. So looking at creosol, we were able to make bisphenols that are much more similar to bisphenol A. And the way that works, if you look at the scheme on the left, you can take creosol and react it with aldehydes. You can use a, a very simple aldehyde like formaldehyde or uh, acid aldehyde, propion aldehyde, et cetera. So you can make a whole series of compounds. Um, I've got three actually that are shown to the right. Um, and these, the structures of these are actually unique compared to most bisphenols. So unlike bisphenol A that actually has uh, parasubstitution of the phenol, uh, these are actually substituted at the meta to the, uh, the hydroxy group. Uh, so it wasn't clear to us initially if these would behave like conventional cyanate esters. Um, it turns out that all of these cure. Uh, if you look at the, the table on, on the slide, um, you can see that for example, looking at the uh, as-cured glass transition temperature. So for 4, 5, and 6, which are, are shown above, the structures are shown above, they actually have as-cured glass transition temperatures above 250 degrees C. So this is very, very promising. Uh, and you know, they're relatively unmodified. So they still have, for example, methoxy groups. They still have alkyl groups uh, on the aromatic ring. Uh, but they behave very well in terms of glass transition temperature. When we try and fully cure them to increase the TG, so we heat them up to temperatures above 300 degrees C, we see that the glass transition temperature actually goes down. So they're not as thermally stable as conventional cyanate esters that don't have, for example, orthomethoxy groups. Um, they have reasonable wet glass transition temperatures. The way we measure that is we actually take uh, thermoset materials and we, we put them in uh, boiling water for four days. Um, and then we, we pull them out and measure the, the glass transition temperature. Um, and they have moderate water uptake, so between about 2 and 3%. Uh, so for the parameters of this, uh, this program, those properties were fine. Uh, as you'll see, we, we've improved upon them, but uh, this is a very interesting, uh, interesting start. So let's look at the thermal stability of these. You can uh, compare that to, to what we saw for the vanillin-derived resins and notice that they're, they're much more thermally stable. Um, they really start to, to see significant weight loss uh, well above 300 degrees C. Um, one of the very, very interesting things that we noticed uh, when we uh, looked at the degradation of these was the products that were produced. Uh, so I don't actually have the, the IR spectroscopy spectroscopic data that we collected, um, but I do have some of the mass uh, spec data that we collected. So if you look to the right, we actually saw that instead of degrading to really small molecules, which is typical of cyanate esters, at elevated temperature, we actually saw that they degraded to produce phenols, so both bisphenols and, uh, and monophenols. Uh, the reason why that's interesting is you could conceive of a scheme in which you selectively degrade these molecules after their service life is over and you actually generate uh, the starting phenols to produce new, uh, new thermoset resins. So that's sort of illustrated in the bottom right-hand uh, corner of the slide. Um, we believe that the electron donation of the methoxy groups uh, is probably what's, what's driving this lower temperature degradation. Uh, and so that's, that's quite interesting for potentially recycling materials made from these materials. You'll note uh, in the table on the left, the char yield uh, in nitrogen versus the char yield in air. The char yield in air is, is very low, around 8 to 11 percent for all these materials. Uh, and so we believe that the, a degradation pathway that included uh, significant amounts of particularly water uh, would allow for these, these materials to be recycled. So that's quite interesting. We 
we wanted to uh, further study exactly how methoxy groups affected the degradation, and uh, Rula saved you uh, from a very complicated synthetic scheme, so I've, I've simplified it greatly. Um, so you can see on the left uh, an example of uh, the bisphenols that have methoxy groups. We can actually uh, selectively deoxygenate the molecules to form cyanate esters like the ones you see on the right of the figure. Um, so that's done by essentially making sulfonates from the, uh, the bisphenol, uh, eliminating those sulfonates via a palladium catalyzed reaction, and then converting the methoxy groups to phenols followed by conversion to cyanate esters. Um, so the question was, what is the impact of the methoxy groups? And this, by studying the, the molecules you see on the right, allows us to uh, quantitatively analyze the difference between the two sets of resins. So we can look at the, the differences in water uptake, the differences in dry and wet TG, the differences in melting point, thermal stability, et cetera. So let's take a look at, at some of those results. So I've got a number of tables here. Uh, the one on the top left is the difference in melting point. So if we have just a methylene group, as we do in, uh, for compound four and compound 16, we see that by removing the methoxy group, we actually decrease the melting point by 37 degrees Celsius. Interestingly enough, if we have uh, an acylidine bridging group, where R is a methyl group, we actually see an increase in the melting point. That was kind of an, an interesting and, and somewhat anomalous result. But if we have a propylidine group, where the R group is ethyl, we actually saw a decrease of more than 95 degrees Celsius. And in fact, that resin was a liquid at room temperature. Uh, liquid resins are particularly important for this project because at, at the end of when we uh, actually formulate uh, bulk molding compounds, we'd really like them to be liquids. Uh, it makes the, the fabrication of parts much easier. So this is a, a welcome result. Um, moving on to uh, glass transition temperature, if we look at the, the table on the right, uh, actually for compound 16, we weren't able to measure uh, the difference in water, take, wa water uptake or the, the wet TG. That resin actually was kind of poorly behaved. But for compound 17, we noticed uh, a, a decrease of 19% in water uptake uh, and an increase in 29 degrees in the wet TG. We also noticed for 18, uh, a decrease of 43% in the water uptake and an increase in wet TG of 37 degrees C. So you can see that removing the methoxy groups really improves the properties of these resins. Um, finally, just looking at the, the glass transition temperatures, we saw increases of 12 to 30 degrees C in the glass transition temperature, uh, the dry glass transition temperature as a result of removing the methoxy groups. So the methoxy groups do make an enormous difference. Uh, so I mentioned before that the degradation of the, the methoxy-based resins, when we look at the degradation of, of the resins with the, the methoxy groups removed, as you would expect, they have much higher thermal stability. So you can see a, a, the TGA data on the left. On the right, we can see some of the products uh, produced by the degradation. So instead of producing uh, molecules like bisphenols and phenols, these degrade to very small molecules. So it's a much higher temperature degradation, but we see molecules like isocyanic acid, carbon dioxide, methane, and ammonia produced instead of molecules like phenols. So it would not be very easy to uh, necessarily recycle these materials compared to the uh, methoxy functionalized ones. Well, let's move on to some other resin types, and we've, we've done uh, a variety of different bisphenols and resins, so this is just a sampling. Uh, this one is particularly interesting because one of these resins is, is one that we've made on, on scales of up to uh, greater than a pound and have actually even fabricated composites from. But anisole is uh, an abundant phenolic precursor that you can actually get from uh, crude sulfate turpentine, for example. Um, we can make two uh, cyanate ester resins from this. Uh, the one on the left actually has a moderate TG of 223 degrees, but it has a very low water uptake, and it's actually a liquid at room temperature. Uh, the one on the right, Psi A Psi, uh, has a remarkable glass transition temperature of 313 degrees C, so in some cases it, it actually outperforms a number of petroleum-based resins and a moderate water uptake. Uh, we'll get back to ISO ACY uh, a little bit later in the talk. 
Um, if you drank any red wine last night or over the weekend, uh, you were drinking a little bit of a molecule called uh, transresveratrol. Uh, this one's particularly interesting because we can form a tris-cyanate ester, so mainly we've, we've been looking at bis-cyanate esters. As you may imagine, if we have three functional groups, we can get to higher cross-link densities, and we would imagine that we would get much higher glass transition temperatures. Uh, so we have, we've actually come up with new synthetic routes to, uh, to transresveratrol that start from simple phenols like syringaldehyde, which you can get from, from lignin and various other uh, cheap uh, substrates. Um, and we made, we made two bisphenols, one, uh, one that's hydrogenated, so that's H2 resci, and one that's unhydrogenated. And we'll look at some of the properties of, of those two molecules on the next slide. So the glass transition temperatures for these uh, cyanate esters are quite remarkable. Uh, if we look at res -sci, remember that's the one that's not hydrogenated. Uh, we actually get a post-cure TG greater than 350 degrees C, which is quite remarkable. Interestingly, though, uh, due to the rigidity of the molecule and the number of cross-linking groups, uh, it doesn't cure completely. Uh, we can observe that by the modest uh, wet glass transition temperature and the very high water uptake. So as a standalone resin, res -sci is is probably not ideal. It also has a relatively high melting point. The hydrogenated version also gives a remarkable glass transition temperature of around 335 degrees Celsius, um, and it does cure completely. It has a moderate water uptake of 2.33%. Uh, we can blend it with uh, lisi, which is another bisphenol. This is a petroleum-based bisphenol that's a liquid. Uh, it's much easier to process. The, uh, the co-resin, when cured, has a glass transition temperature greater than 350 degrees C, again, quite remarkable and uh, moderate water uptake. Um, we've also sent these resins to the FAA, and they've taken a, a look at the flammability of them via small-scale calorimetry reactions. Uh, and they noted that for res -sci, it had the lowest heat release um, that they'd ever seen for a polymer system. H2 res -sci similarly has excellent properties in this regard, and both of these resins at this point can be classified as ultra-fire resistant polymers. Um, they have remarkable char yields as well. For example, res -sci has a char yield of 74%, and H2 res -sci has a char yield of, of 70%. Uh, so these are, are quite remarkable for applications when, when flammability is an issue. I'll move on to another resin. This is uh, some recent work, uh, and this, the name of the molecule that we started with is actually eugenol. Uh, the chemistry with this molecule is, is quite fun. I don't, if, there are any chemists on the line, you're probably uh, not used to working with molecules that smell quite as good as eugenol. It's actually the main component uh, in clove oil and smells just like clove. Um, anyway, the reason eugenol is so interesting is it has a pendant alkene group that we can actually do a, a metathesis reaction uh, to form a bisphenol. We can do this reaction uh, without any solvent, so it's, it's ran neat. Um, and then simple hydrogenation gives us uh, a saturated bisphenol. You can see the, the synthesis of it there on the left. Uh, it's a very symmetric molecule, so you can see both the bisphenol on top and a crystal structure of the cyanate ester on the bottom. Um, and one of the reasons this was interesting is that cyanate esters are, are typically very, very rigid, uh, and we wanted to induce a, a certain amount of flexibility to increase the toughness of, of either blends or of the cyanate ester itself. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why eugenol was an interesting starting material. So let's look at some of the properties. Uh, on the left, actually, we conceived of an idea where we uh, do a blending study, where we take the eugenol cyanate ester, which actually has a, a moderate glass transition temperature of 186 degrees C, and blend it with a polycarbonate that we also synthesize from eugenol um, that has a glass transition temperature of 71 degrees C. When we blended them together and cured them, we actually got a material that had a single glass transition temperature at 132 degrees C. If you look to the right, you can actually see um, thermal mechanical analysis of a sample that shows a, a single glass transition temperature at 132 degrees C. And we also ran a, a, an experiment on the bottom called a small angle laser light scattering. Uh, so initially, when we've got crystalline cyanate ester around, you can see that we have a, a very high uh, intensity of scattered light. 
uh, it then melts and forms a, an amorphous mixture and virtually no scattering. What we would ex typically expect to see is an increase in scattering as the cyanate ester resin cures due to phase separation. But in fact, we see no phase separation. Uh, so there's no phase separation by the SALS experiment. There's no phase separation by TMA. So it suggests that we're forming uh, a homogeneous network, which could be very useful for forming uh, toughened thermoset, thermoset material. Um, so I'll just really quickly summarize some of the recent developments that, that I'm not going over in this brief, but that uh, uh, you'll hopefully be hearing about in the literature very soon. Uh, so we've prepared a resin from a significant component of pine resin that has outstanding hot-wet performance, has a dry TG of 224 degrees C, but a wet TG of that only drops by 3 degrees C to 20, 221 degrees C, and it has one of the lowest water uptakes we've ever seen for a cyanate ester resin of 0.7%. We've also generated uh, liquid resins on 100-gram scales that, have, that has a glass transition temperature of greater than 270 degrees C. Um, we've developed a process to potentially generate uh, renewable leaf size, so that would be the same resin, the same as the commercial resin I talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, and we've looked at really low-cost uh, cyanate esters that can be derived from uh, cashew nut shell oil. Cashew nut shell oil can actually be purchased for around a dollar a pound, so we believe we could make uh, very low-cost resins from that. Um, and we've done some more work on uh, non-flammable hybrid resins that incorporate uh, phosphorus. Uh, so being in year three of the program, we've actually gone all the way from, uh, from concept to uh, resin synthesis to uh, the fabrication of flat panels and even all the way to composite part fabrication. Um, so I'll let this slide speak a little bit for itself, but one of the parts that we were interested in designing was is called a, a polar boss. Um, and probably many of you have worked for a, a bipolar boss, but uh, this is just a polar boss. Um, anyway, it's essentially used uh, to provide support to the aft end of a rocket motor and attach the nozzle to the missile case. These are typically produced from aluminum, and we believe that by producing it from a bulk molding compound, we could both uh, reduce the weight and reduce the, the fabrication uh, the, the lead time for fabrication for these materials. In addition, uh, the, the properties, for example, the, the flexural strength and compressive strength of bulk, molding, bulk molding compounds can actually outperform aluminum. Um, so let's move on to see a picture of a polar boss that we actually made. So you can see uh, two views of, of a polar boss that was prepared. This was done by the uh, Air Force Research Laboratory. Um, so this is uh, composed of 157 grams of the uh, isoanisole disyanate ester that we looked at earlier. The reason we used that resin was the, uh, the fact that it's a liquid at uh, room temperature. Um, we've done initial testing with flat panels of, the, of this resin system, and uh, they compare very well to both aluminum um, and epoxy-based bulk molding compounds. Uh, and we're con uh, constructing a, a specialized test stand to actually uh, perform uh, physical testing on these bulk or on these uh, polar bosses uh, this year, so that testing will be complete this year. So, in conclusion, we've synthesized a, a wide variety of high-performance uh, cyanate ester resins with glass transition temperatures ranging from about 180 to uh, greater than 350 degrees Celsius. Um, some of these resins actually outperform conventional petroleum-based resins. And as I think I've shown through some of the synthetic slides, uh, the structural diversity of those phenols actually allows for simplified uh, synthetic procedures. Um, all the phenols that I've talked about can be sustainably sourced from uh, domestic biomass feedstocks. Um, if they are produced at, at large scale, they could potentially be produced for lower cost than petroleum-based analogs. Um, I didn't talk a lot about this, but many of the bisphenols uh, I talked about are expected to have less toxicity or less estrogenic effects than bisphenol A, and we're, we're looking at that uh, some more with collaborators. Um, and obviously, you know, the increased use of composites and we weapon platforms uh, instead of, of metals uh, is expected to increase warfighter capability by 
increasing the range and loiter time of, of weapon systems and decreasing overall fuel consumption. So with that, um, you know, if you have, would like additional information, you can go to CERTIP's web page. You can contact me at the uh, phone number and uh, uh, email below. Uh, and obviously, I, I mentioned a number of papers that, that have been written on, on this topic, so uh, please look those up as well. Thank you so much, Ben. And we have a number of questions that have come in. Um, the first one has to do with um, pretreatment or isolation of the cashew nut shell oil. Is that needed? Um, so the, the way we got it was uh, directly from, from the company. So there is, there is some pretreatment. It's essentially just a, a distillation process. Um, and, and it comes about 95% uh, pure as the crude material that, that we get for about a dollar a pound. Uh, so there was no, no real pretreatment required. Great, thank you. And what is the impact of reduced petroleum prices on the transition towards renewable polymers, in your opinion? Well, that's a, a great question. So obviously, uh, you know, whether you're talking about renewable fuels or renewable polymers, decreased oil prices are going to put some pressure on, on that industry and, and make it potentially less, uh, less appealing to companies. But uh, I think everyone realizes, and particularly uh, researchers realize, that we need to continue to develop sustainable solutions to, uh, to ongoing problems. You know, the, the other issue is if we are able to use things like cashew nutshell oil um, and other very low-cost phenols, even at decreased petroleum prices, we should be able to be at least competitive with them. Um, and I think everyone knows that the price of oil is going back up at some point. So. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, are there other BPA-type scaffolds that you can develop based on re renewable or petroleum-derived chemicals to reduce toxicity while maintaining high performance? Oh, absolutely. Um, the, the field's really open there. And, you know, as I said, I just mentioned a few specific structures. We have studied many others, um, and, and those results will be coming out in the open literature soon. Uh, but yeah, there are a variety of different uh, different structures that we could look at. Um, you know, some of the work that, that's also been done in this program has looked at at other structures, potentially from uh, uh, anethol, that have very high glass transition temperatures, and, and we have ways, obviously, to control uh, how these molecules uh, interact with with active sites. Uh, that, that would actually determine their toxicity or their estrogenicity, so absolutely. Thank you. And one last question before we move to our last speaker, and this is another question from our audience. How is the glass transition temperature compared to the required operational temperature for high temp resistant components? Stated another way, what temperatures must these parts withstand? It really depends on the application. That's a great question. Um, if you go back to the slides, uh, you can see that uh, really the, the use temperature for, for some of the aluminum, com aluminum components in aluminum polar boss, for example, would be, be, would be about 160 degrees C. Um, epoxies that are used in bulk molding compounds have glass transition temperatures of about 190 degrees C. So any benefit we can give above uh, epoxy resin, so above 190 degrees C, uh, would be outstanding. For some of the applications, we'd like to be above 250 degrees C. So I think in that range from about 220 to uh, probably 280 degrees C is, is where we want to be for most of the applications we're looking at. All right. Thank you again, Ben, for a very interesting presentation. And we'll have more time towards the end to ask you some more questions, but we're going to transition now to our final speaker on this webinar, and that is Dr. John Lascala. John is the Chief of Coatings, Corrosion, and Engineered Polymers Branch at the Army Research Laboratory at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland. Dr. Lascala has been working on bias-based, environmentally friendly resins and polymer technology for composites, adhesives, and coating, um, coatings applications for over 17 years. Uh, his scientific advances are evidenced by over 50 open literature publications he is also the recipient of multiple national awards, including the 2013 Presidential Award in Green Chemistry from the EPA and ACS, 
and also the 2011 Secretary of Defense Environmental Excellence in Weapons System Acquisition Small Program Award. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending, I guess, on where uh, you guys are calling in from. Uh, so I'm John Lascala from the Army Research Laboratory, and I'll be talking today about environmentally friendly, high-performance bio-based polymers for DOD applications. This, pro this uh, particular work that I'm showing is a summary of a number of CERTA projects, one past, one recently completed, and one that we uh, just started up this past year, as well as an ESTCP project um, that we uh, finished up a number of years ago as well. Uh, there were a number of collaborators on, me, uh, on this, uh, proje these projects with me, including numerous from the Army Research Laboratory, uh, Drexel University, Clemson University, University of Delaware, Rowan University, AFRL, uh, the Army Public Health Command, and uh, even Ben Harvey, the previous speaker, is a collaborator on our current sort of project. Um, so just wanted to thank all of them for all, all the work they've done on this. I'm going to be talking about three things today. First off, and, and Ben covered a good amount of this, but uh, why is the DOD interested in bio-based polymers? I'll talk briefly about that, and then I'll look in, we'll talk uh, a little bit about plant oil-based polymers, which was our first foray into bio-based polymers. And, and the goal there was to make uh, certain polymers, in particular vinyl esters and unsaturated polyesters, a little bit more environmentally friendly. But there were some issues associated with those materials, which is resulted in our move to lignocellulosic-based thermosets, which I'll talk, to, talk about in the third part of the talk. So uh, again, uh, Ben talked a good amount about this, but uh, to, to kind of re reiterate certain points, uh, the DOD is very much interested in high-performance composites and polymer use. Uh, the, the use of these materials is increasing in the DOD due to increased performance, uh, corrosion resistance, and uh, overall reduced cost. And you can see a basic example would be in, say, a jet fighter, where F4, the F-14 contained only two weight percent composite materials, but now the JSF contains over 30 weight percent composite materials. So the DOD is definitely moving in that way. Now, the Army is a little bit slower on that curve uh, due to its high, high need for armor uh, and, and such. So there's a lot of metals in, in the Army, but nonetheless, there are still more composites and more composites every year. Um, and the pictures on the right show some examples of composites throughout the DOD. Now, one of the problems with these uh, composites um, and these uh, high-performance polymers is that they're all generated from petroleum, and, uh, and in and of itself, that makes them all non-carbon neutral, makes them non-sustainable in, in various fashions, but also numerous of these high-performance polymers produce Hazardous air, uh, hazardous air pollutant emissions. They, uh, they may be, as Andrew talked about, a sensitizer like isocyanates, which are used in uh, certain composite resins as well. Um, or they produce other uh, hazardous solvents. They use hazardous solvents. They produce other chemicals, hazardous chemicals, during the, the process that uh, is not environmentally friendly or potentially even toxic to the users or to, to things in the environment. So for this reason, uh, those reasons, it's a good reason that uh, the DOD wants to move towards bio-based polymers, uh, as well as, you know, obviously the petroleum exploration and refining has issues associated with it. But uh, in addition, there are various regulations in the DOD and the Army that encourage the use of green and uh, renewable-type polymers for, for applications. Uh, another thing that, that Ben talked about was the... Um, unstable oil costs. Now, obviously, they're not rising right now for once, which is quite nice. Uh, I think we all appreciate that. But as Ben mentioned, we, we do expect these prices to go back up at some point in the future, and that is going to affect the um, feasibility of using certain composite materials in the Army, especially where cost is a very large driver. So it's important that we have a bio-based solution as well as potentially a petroleum solution so that the Army can get the cheapest price of the materials as they can get. And another reason why we want to use uh, bio-based polymers is that uh, there's a little bit of stagnancy in terms of uh, petroleum-based polymers where there's various 
uh, polymers out there, and they're basically just reusing the same ones, processing them in the different, different ways to get a little bit different performance. Bio roots and bio-based polymers allow us a potential to get very different polymer properties, potentially much improved polymer properties. And, and those, uh, those, for those reasons, we're doing research in these areas. What we would like to do is develop basically a paradigm change in polymer manufacture. So it's not just from petroleum to high performance polymers, but we can use renewable based materials like plant oils, carbohydrates, lignin, cellulose, uh, and make high performance polymers. And the way to do that, especially right now, is if we look at the biofuels industry, they're basically they're making all sorts of fuels, but they're also making um, various other chemicals from these renewable materials that don't have much of an application. But a number of these chemicals we see, and we see that they can be used to make monomers and then uh, polymers and composites. So our group has really been focused on that aspect of converting these chemicals into monomers and polymers and assessing the properties. Now, for thermosetting materials, which is the focus of my talk today, uh, there's really a balance of a number of properties uh, outside of the toxicity uh, issues and environmental issues, which I'm going to talk about as well. Uh, but there are various some uh, important properties of these materials, including the glass transition temperature. We want a high glass transition temperature. For the Army, uh, about 120 is mostly acceptable, but for various other applications, high performance, we want TGs, as Ben talked about, closer to 300 degrees Celsius. Uh, we would also like to have a toughness. Uh, at least of 100 joules per meter squared. Um, we need to have modulus over 2 gigapascals at room temperature and a strength over 100 megapascals at room temperature. And also, because these are composites, essentially in thermosetting composites, you're taking a liquid resin and you're injecting it into uh, a mat of fibers. And you want this resin to be able to infiltrate all the, the pores and produce uh, a high-performance composite part with no voids, and with very good fiber matrix adhesion. And to do that, you need to have a low viscosity for your resin. So somewhere, depending on the application, generally you want a maximum of about 500 centipoys, in particular for liquid molding applications. So that's really been our main target, is to try to achieve that. Um, and another factor is, is certainly cost of the resin. Um, if you make a great resin with much improved properties, but the cost is triple that of the conventional resin, and there's no path towards reducing that cost, then there's going to be a problem. Now, as Andrew mentioned, there's often initially uh, the cost will be high, but hopefully there will be a, a path forward to reducing that cost through economy of scale. So that's, uh, again, something that we're interested in and something that we're looking at. In, in, uh, in this work, because it's such a uh, summary, only 25 minutes to show it all, I'm not really going to show properties along all these avenues and costs, but uh, understand that we performed property analysis and cost analysis of all these materials, and I'll just touch on highlights of each. Uh, so moving to the next slide, um, we're going to begin by talking about fatty acid-based polymers and how we use them to reduce the environmental issues associated with vinyl ester resins. But because they had certain issues associated with them, we've moved over to using a carbohydrate and lignin-based polymers really as the way to get higher performing and higher bio content. So uh, we invented these compounds called methacrylated fatty acids, or MFAs, which are a simple reaction of a fatty acid with glycyl methacrylate, which is an industrially, uh, industrial commodity chemical. And we produce this MFA, it's a single one-step reaction, no separation required. Can ma we made this in very high purity. And what we found is this is a good molecule, it, because it has a methacrylate group on the end, it's capable of reacting and polymerizing with vinyl esters and styrene uh, and other uh, vinyl uh, functional chemicals to make a cross-linked polymer. Now, there are certain aspects of the fatty acid molecule that are more desirable and certain ones that are less desirable. If we look at that uh, plot of conversion versus time on the bottom right, we see that as we uh, have fatty acids with more unsaturation, this actually affects its ability to cure. So we want to have actually fatty acids that are saturated, uh, was found to be ideal. As well as we found that decreasing uh, or increasing the fatty acid chain length decreased the glass transition temperature and increased the viscosity, both undesirable properties. But when looking at cost, 
we basically came to an optimum fatty acid length that balanced the properties as well as, uh, as cost. And on the next slide, I show the fatty acid uh, vinyl ester resins, or FAVE, that we made, which is a combination of vinyl ester crosslinker monomer, um, which is that top molecular structure there. Uh, and typically in commercial vinyl esters, that's blended with styrene, which is uh, a, a, a reactive diluent used to reduce the viscosity of the vinyl ester, that vinyl ester molecule on its own. You wouldn't even know it's a liquid if you, it's very, very viscous liquid. Um, so it needs the styrene to do liquid molding applications. And typically we're talking about adding well over 40 weight percent styrene to the resin. In this work, we took, we added the methacrylated fatty acids to reduce the viscosity of these vinyl esters. And we did have to use some amount of styrene in these resins, as I'll show you on the next few slides. But we were able to reduce that styrene content to 10 to 25 percent, and most commonly about 20 weight percent styrene. In all, this allows us to re increase our renewable content in our polymers while reducing HAP and VOC emissions. Styrene is a hazardous air pollutant, so it's very important to, to reduce the amount of emissions from these uh, resins as possible. <clears throat> so there are various benefits to the methacrylated fatty acids and the, fi uh, the fatty acid vinyl ester resins. First, if we look at this plot in the upper left corner, um, we see basically the mass as a function of time. Basically what we did was we took a sample of our resin and we put it in an oven at a, uh, particular, um, a particular temperature and looked at the mass loss as a function of time, and we found that the methacrylated fatty acids themselves are non-volatile, uh, as opposed to the commercial vinyl ester resin shown in blue are very volatile. They'll lose all their styrene mass as a function of time, and they lose it at a very rapid rate initially. Whereas the fatty acid vinyl ester resin shown in pink uh, lose only, again, their styrene content and lose it at a lower rate. So that's a, a significant advantage of these fatty acid vinyl ester resins. The plot on the bottom right shows the fracture toughness as a function of styrene content. And so if we have zero styrene content, we have a significant amount of fatty acid monomer in there. And we can see when we have that, we actually have a higher fracture toughness than when we have no methacrylated fatty acid in there. And in fact, we, we achieve an optimum with some fatty acid monomer and some styrene in there. So the fatty acids, once again, benefit the properties there. But in some cases, they do create a, um, they do create a negative effect. Uh, they have various trade-offs, including viscosity, where viscosity increases as we increase the methacrylated fatty acid content. And really, we, can, we could accept no more than about 25 weight percent fatty acid in these vinyl ester resins, as well as uh, the glass transition temperature or strength shown on the graph on the right um, decreases with increasing fatty acid content. So uh, again, we, uh, there's, that's a detriment to these fatty acid monomers. But you can achieve very good strength and glass transition temperature with a moderate amount of fatty acid monomer while having small amount of styrene as well. Um, so that's an advantage to those materials. We then ver made various composites uh, from these materials uh, using the Vardum process, uh, which I, I depict here, and I'm not going to go into the details on that. Uh, but these simple composites that we made were for uh, testing various properties like strength, modulus, short beam shear strength, and glass transition temperature, and a number of other properties. We measure this as a function of numerous reinforcements. We aged the composites, exposed them to fluids, did all sorts of weathering on these materials. And this is just a general summary of the results here. The, in, on blue, the blue bars show the vinyl ester with styrene. And that's, that's, we normalized all the properties to that, uh, those particular samples. So they're all normalized to one, as you can see. And you can see that the fatty acid vinyl ester shown in red have a, either a slight knockdown or about the same property as that of the vinyl ester. And we can go to this FAVEHT, shown in green, to improve the properties a little bit more. But there's a slight knockdown in the performance relative to the standard vinyl esters. Nonetheless, we re these resins perform very well when it came to demonstration and validation for various DOD applications, including in the top left, you can see the, this composite rudder that we manufactured. 
uh, that had uh, excellent performance and met all the requirements necessary for a composite rudder. The bottom left, uh, we could see this truck hood that we manufactured uh, and then tested using that test rig shown in the middle picture. Um, basically, we can load the, the, the hood with uh, various weights, fatigue it, tors apply torsion, and, and the material, the composite performed uh, similarly, essentially no different from that of the commercial vinyl ester resin used. Resin. Uh, and then on the right, we showed uh, a fatty acid, uh, the fatty acid vinyl ester resin being used for uh, a particular aircraft part. This is a canopy cover uh, for the F-22, which performed quite well. So moving on. The fatty acid vinyl ester resins were very successful. They won a number of awards. This technology was transitioned to a company, Dixie Chemicals, for commercial and DOD use. But it was limited in the amount of, fatty, of bio content that we can use. And the properties were not fantastic. They were good for low-end DOD applications, but not for high-end. So in the next slide, we talk about basically replacing bisphenol A, basically like Ben talked about, using um, a number of other scaffolds that can re uh, hopefully reduce the toxicity of BPA, which is an endocrine disruptor and there's various toxicities associated with it, um, with things like furans, isosorbide, vanillin, uh, to make a variety of different resins like vinyl esters, epoxies, polyurethanes, uh, diamines for polyimids and epoxy curing agents, et cetera. One of the first things we uh, made was this isosorbide methacrylate, which uh, you can see the molecule uh, in the center of the page. It's a fairly small molecule, compact relative to that of the vinyl ester crosslinker itself, and it has a much lower viscosity. The viscosity of it, as shown in the, the graph on the top right, is only 150 centipoise compared to that of a vinyl ester crosslinker with a viscosity of uh, about 50,000 centipoise, so orders of magnitude lower viscosity. The molecular weight is only a slight difference, um, about half of the viscosity, and we would expect the viscosity to be proportional to the molecular weight uh, unless there's another factor, which indeed there was. We found that hydrogen bonding, or the lack thereof, in isosorbide methacrylate was the reason for this much reduced viscosity. So this isosorbide methacrylate is beneficial in that you can replace styrene entirely and the vinyl ester itself, and make a nearly 100% bio-based vinyl ester resin using this isosorbide methacrylate that's uh, very easy to process. Now, how are the properties? If we look at the next slide, uh, we could see properties like, in particular, glass transition temperature and modulus were excellent. Uh, the, the modulus was 3 gigapascals at room temperature, which is great, but the glass transition temperature, as shown by that green curve uh, on the plot, the tan delta, is over 250 degrees Celsius, which is far higher than that of any commercial vinyl ester. Commercial, high temperature commercial vinyl esters, we're talking 180 degrees Celsius. So this is an example of bio being able to be used to make higher performing materials than conventional materials. Furthermore, is when we cured this resin with, we did, for the purposes of science, cured it with, uh, with styrene because we felt we made a fairly defective network. When we cured it with styrene, we got about the same glass transition temperature, 250 degrees Celsius, which allows us to use the Flory-Fox equation to predict the ultimate glass transition temperature of this isosorbide methacrylate, which we predicted at 376 degrees Celsius, which, again, is far higher than that of the commercial vinyl ester crosslinkers of about 200 degrees Celsius. So, again, excellent performance for this isosorbide methacrylate. Uh, we then also looked at furans to, to replacing benzene-based uh, rings in, uh, in these high-performance materials. Uh, and if we look at um, this, uh, basically we have these diepoxy um, benzene ring, or this BOB structure, compared to this BOF structure, which is a diepoxy furan. And you can see that the, the, the diepoxy furan has a higher glass transition temperature, 69 degrees versus 55 degrees for the benzene-based one. That's due to the lack of symmetry, as well as some hydrogen bonding associated with the furan ring. Uh, so using furans can actually be beneficial. One negative, however, is that the, there is a, methyl spacer, uh, a methylene spacer group between the furan group and the epoxide ring that detrimentally affects the properties. And we figured this out by 
looking at this DGEPP molecule versus that BOB molecule. And when we cured those, the DGEPP had a much higher glass transition temperature because it didn't have that methylene spacer versus the BOB. So with furans, they're good, but we really need to figure out a way to reduce that methylene spacer to get to the high TG. At the same time, these molecules, though, produce a very high toughness, so they're very good molecules, uh, and very good for potentially for coatings and various other applications, uh, and lower low performing composites for certain. And we do believe they can be used for high performance composites, and we're working on that as well. Now, on this next slide, I'm talking about using um, uh, uh, replacing BPA, bisphenol A, with uh, with basically lignin derived materials as well as potentially furans. The reason being is when we looked at the synthesis of bisphenol A, basically what happens in the reaction scheme is phenol reacts with formaldehyde under acidic conditions, and it forms this uh, effectively a reactive intermediate, this um, a phenol with a, with a methyl hydroxyl group on it, which then can react with another phenol very readily. The addition of that first, that formaldehyde to the phenol is really the great limiting step. And an interesting thing is, there are bio-based molecules, vanilla alcohol and furfural alcohol, that already have that functionality on them. So we decided to use those to make bisphenol A surrogates. Uh, and we can see that reaction scheme between vanilla alcohol and guaiacol, which are lignin derivatives. We're able to produce what we called uh, bisqui bisquiacol F, or BGF, which is very similar to bisphenol A, but it has as a uh, as very similar to some of the molecules then produced here, as a methoxy group attached to the benzene rings. What we found is the toxicity of these materials are significantly reduced. We did this through QSAR uh, measurements, where we show that the, uh, the BGF bioaccumulation is much less than that of, that, uh, of that of BPA, and the toxicity, the aquatic toxicity in this particular case is more than an order of magnitude lower for the BGF relative to the BPA. So uh, results indicate that these materials reduce toxicity, and we're in, in the process of experimentally measuring the toxicity to determine that as well. So far, some preliminary res results we've achieved have indicated this as well, but we're, uh, we have not completed that, so we're still waiting on those. The reason we believe this is the case is that methoxy group, uh, effectively these molecules react with enzymes in the body, and uh, BPA basically mimics estradiol, um, but BGF, because of that methoxy group, can't really fit into the same space as the BPA does, and therefore should reduce the toxicity. Other things about these materials is we found that they have very good uh, TGs, um, similar to that of uh, BPA-based vinyl esters, as well as the epoxy resins that we made from them have been excellent so far as well. So the last thing that we're doing in our current CERTA project is basically taking this concept and saying, okay, small structural changes on the molecules can significantly affect the toxicity. We found there's a particular uh, resin out there, PMR15, that is highly desirable for high-performance composite applications, but it uses methylene dianalin, or MDA, which is highly toxic. So we think if we can make slight derivatives of this MDA, we can significantly reduce the toxicity while still achieving those high properties. So we've made some various diamine structures like this diamino uh, difuran structure and diamino isosorbide, as well as derivatives of furans with uh, benzene-based uh, amines, and, uh, and then creosol reacted to form these diamines, which uh, actually uh, very similar that work, particular work came from Ben. Uh, instead of uh, making the, um, uh, the cyanate esters, they, may, they uh, may have converted those into amines. But all these molecules have the potential to be very high performance as well as significantly reduce toxicity. So we look forward to getting more results on that to determine that in full. Uh, but otherwise, in summary, we determined that plant oil-based resins can be used to reduce emissions but do diminish thermal performance. Lignocellulosic-based resins can have much greater thermal and mechanical properties and have high application to a variety of high-performance polymers. And renewable resins and polymers can be used to reduce environmental and toxicity issues. And we show that these polymers have demonstrated success in the lab, field, and commercial industry. Um, and if uh, you're seeking more information, please uh, see the CERTIP website or contact me using my email or phone number.
be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, John, for a fascinating presentation. We're going to wrap this up with our final Q&A session. And I'll start with a question for you, John. Um, what is uh, the, what do you think is the biggest <coughs> obstacle to commercializing and utilizing renewable material? Yeah, um, I think uh, if the biggest obstacle is likely going to be um, is going to be the way we factor in cost. Most commercial, uh, most companies really are looking at cost as, as the bottom line. What does the particular resin cost me? Not what does it, you know, if, what does it cost me now as I buy it? Not what does it cost me as I look at the whole cradle to grave cycle? Uh, and until that sort of paradigm shift is made, I, we're, I think we're always going to struggle with that. Um, I think a lot of these resins offer major benefits, but further downstream than the initial bottom line cost. And we'll, some will, will be able to be competitive with that bottom line cost and those be able to transition, but some will struggle that way. And, and until that's changed, that's going to be the issue there. Thank you, John. And what, in your opinion, is the most critical property of renewable polymers that requires improvement? And what are the methodologies that can be employed to improve them? Yeah, um, there are, it, it really is going to depend on the particular application. For DOD purposes, right now, I'd say that the biggest thing that we're trying to do and, and have had pretty good success on is really pushing that upper envelope of combination of glass transition temperature and high fracture toughness um, and high strength, uh, while also being... Uh, having a low viscosity for composite applications. Um, glass transition temperature, there have been a few resins that have, been, have gotten particularly high TGs, but they may have struggled in one or, or, or the other areas. So that, to me, the next one is really fracture toughness, improving that. There, these materials are often so highly cross-linked that it's hard to achieve that high fracture toughness. Um, what I would say there uh, is going to be ways to, to affect that is to reduce the fracture, reduce the cross-linking some, but still having very rigid core molecules to enable high glass transition temperature. Great. Thank you. We have a question from our audience about the cost per pound of the resins that you talked about. Yeah. So the commercial resins, uh, typical vinyl esters, we're talking uh, the resins are three to four or so dollars a pound. Epoxies can be a little bit more to a lot more, depending on uh, what performance you're looking for, but uh, usually somewhere from $5 a pound and up. Um, these resins, the bio-based resins, we've been estimating at somewhere around $4 a pound to, um, to about six, 5 or so, dollar, 5 to $6 a pound, depending on the particular formulation. And therefore, they're not far away from uh, the cost bogey from these other resins. Some particular resins, I should say, that we've, uh, we've made or uh, we've done some work on have very low costs. We've made some that are closer to a dollar a pound, uh, but we are having some issues with making those high performing. So it doesn't really uh, help at that moment. But until we overcome those issues, um, those won't be a viable resin. But if they do, if we can overcome those, then we'd be able to overcome that cost issue. Thank you, John. As you know, the SIRTUP and ESCCP webinar series is targeting end users. So with that in mind, I'd like to ask you this last question, but then I'd like our other speakers to weigh in on your answer and, and uh, elaborate on it. So the question is, what factors other than cost are currently limiting the development and, transitional, and transition of renewable materials for commercial and military applications? So, John, if you don't mind jumping in, and then we're going to turn it over to Andy and Ben um, for the, also uh, for their answers. I'd say uh, the initial thing is just the inertia, that people are happy with uh, the particular material they're using, and, well, why switch? Uh, if there's a real reason, if there's an environmental concern, uh, if there's a toxicity issue, if there's something like that, people will start to consider changing. At the same time, one of the problems with our composite materials out there is we have very few specs associated with composites in the DOD. 
And therefore, it's hard to say this is the specified material that you should use for that application. Until we kind of move to that sort of thing, I think we're always going to have this problem where the vendors will be choosing things and they might be choosing something else rather than a sustainable approach uh, that's overall better for the DOD than what we uh, currently have. Thank you, John. Andy, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Sure. I, I would say from the military perspective, I think another challenge that we face is the way that risk is uh, avoided and accounted for within the, the DOD structure. If you are uh, somebody who qualifies or certifies materials for DOD applications, uh, a new material always has inherent risks uh, in going to something that is less familiar and less tested. And in the current sort of environment that we have, uh, if something goes wrong with that material or there is an issue or a problem, uh, the people that qualify and certify those materials are still going to be held just as accountable as, as for any other kind of material. So they, they get no credit essentially for having tried to use an environmentally friendly or compliant material. So the, yeah. the risks for them are significant, but if you ask what is their reward for trying an environmental material within the, the DOD system that we have, those rewards are things like uh, being better for the you know environment, less dependence on petroleum. Those, those are diffuse rewards. Those those don't accrue to the people that do the qualification and certification of the material. They there's not much that that comes directly to them. So the way that the risk is distributed, unfortunately, within DoD, uh, oftentimes makes it difficult uh, to get people to take the risks that they need to take. Thank you so much. And Ben, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I have a couple things. Uh, so in regard to that, I think you know one of the key drivers here, in addition to cost, is is performance. So I think webinars like the one uh, everybody's participating in today, where we're we're educating people in regard to the properties of some of these bio-based materials, uh, is essential. So I, I think bio always gets the knock that okay, it's renewable, but it doesn't. It's not going to perform as well as as petroleum-based materials. So I think it's very very important to emphasize that. Not only can we create uh, full performance materials, but in some cases even materials that outperform conventional petroleum-based resins. The, uh, the other hurdle is the avail availability of, of bio-based feedstocks at, at cheap, uh, cheap prices. And uh, I think you have to have, you know, build the market for these renewable composites first, uh, and then companies obviously will, will come in to, to fill that void. So the starting substrates, uh, lignocellulosic biomass, for example, are very, very cheap, but the, the procedures to uh, convert those to, to useful monomers to make bio-based uh, polymers uh, can be very complicated and uh, capital intensive. So uh, we also have to you know, develop that market, uh, build that inertia as, as John was saying, uh, and then I think companies will, will uh, rally to the cause. Great. Thank you so much, Ben. And on behalf of CERTIP and ESTCP, I'd like to thank all our three speakers and also thank our audience for attending today's webinar. As a reminder, uh, the presentation and audio for this webinar will be archived for future reference on the CERTIP and ESTCP webinar page. Our next webinar is on Thursday, February 5th, and it will focus on acoustic methods for underwater munitions. This webinar will feature two speakers, Dr. Joseph Bucaro on behalf of the Naval Research Laboratory and Dr. Kevin Williams from the University of Washington. We really hope that you can join us in two weeks. And before we wrap up, I'd like everybody to please take a moment of your busy day and complete the survey that will pop up on your screen when the webinar ends. Uh, CERTIP and ESCCP have decided to continue with this webinar program and the survey results will help us plan better for the future in order to meet everybody's uh, needs. And with that, I'd like to call it a wrap and thank everyone again for joining. Bye-bye.